Great. Thank you. Hello. I shall begin. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Yana. Hi, Dan. How are you um, doing? I'm good. How are you? Uh, just fine, thanks. <laughs> You're in Massachusetts. <laughs> I am in Massachusetts, yes. It sounds lovely. Okay, I'm going to start by introducing you. And then you can proceed to read from this amazing new book. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jana Prickrell. I'm a senior editor and poetry editor at the New York Review of Books, where Dan has been publishing his trenchant essays and poems since 2009. It's been it's a thrill to be here to help launch his fifth book of poems, The Math Campers. This is a book that seems inked in anguish, in part the anguish prompted by climate change and our complicity with it, but more deeply the anguish of time's passage itself and our dependence as creatures on the medium of time for our sense of who we are. One of the book's great achievements is its fusion of contraries, tenderness with bitterness, acute intellectual play with a sort of liquefied sorrow, liquefying sorrow with sudden eruptions of hilarity, dread of the future with helplessly sweet recollections of youth, and to borrow the title of his first long poem here, Euphrasy and Rue, a phrase that's filched from Paradise Lost, which refers to the herbs that the angel Michael uses to help Adam see clearly, but is also a pun on comedy or euphrasy and desolation or rue, implying, I think, their interdependence in all human affairs. One of the things I've always loved and envied about Dan's work as a poet is his inventiveness. A mark of his restlessness as a thinker is his experimentation with the poetic sequence. It's almost possible to read his whole body of work, starting with his first book, The Afterlife of Objects, as a developing fascination with what the sequence can bring to a book of poems and what the poet can profitably steal from the realm of narrative. One of the devices that the math campers develops to an almost unbearable intensity is repetition, a book about and written almost from the middle of, I take it, middle age, it seems filled with poems that show how all feeling, all our deepest experience is revisited experience. In these new sequences, repetition inevitably gives way to change and even something like betrayal or sabotage. There's a humane virtuosity to the way these long poems explode certain images we come to expect and bring a vast sense of scale into the book. Dan is also, of course, a virtuosic writer of prose, and he brings an astoundingly imaginative sympathy to his readings of new work as the poetry critic of The New Yorker. Meanwhile, for the New York Review of Books, he's written more than 30 consistently surprising pieces in the last decade alone. Dan grew up in Vermont and is the recipient of a Whiting Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is a professor of English at Wellesley, and I'm very, very excited to turn this over to him and these new poems. Thank you, Jana. That was extraordinarily kind. And I just want to say to everyone that Jana is one of my favorite poets, in addition to being a great editor and a great friend to me. And if you want to buy a truly great book of the last two years, I think No Matter by Jana Prickrell is the way to go. Um, if you want to buy two, you could buy mine as well, I suppose. But that's really a great book, which I've taught with great success at Wellesley. So I'm just so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to Maris. Um, I'm grateful to McNally Jackson, which has given me a place to browse and hang out and uh, do events and attend events, you know, for years. And I can't wait to come back. Um, I'm going to launch into this uh, book just with a couple of prefatory remarks. Um, I heard the music of this book as a dialogue um, between um, a prose voice and a poetry voice. And I had to figure out what their relationship was, the relationship between those two voices. So I came up with the idea of a kind of plot where there's a poet who has been sending elements of his work or his work um, to a stranger, to a woman that he doesn't know. And you're going to hear, particularly at the beginning of this reading, I alternate between the poetry voice, the poet's work, and the woman's voice. And what she does is she sort of narrates the experience of receiving these poems and grappling with these poems 
um, uh, and, and so it's a back and forth. It's really hard reading them aloud to distinguish between the two voices. You can see right on the page if you have the book in front of you, what's prose and what's poetry, but I'll do my best. The other thing I would say is um, this book is dedicated to my friend and the great poet Frank Bedard, who enters it as a character at a certain couple of points. And it's set partly, the first section is set mainly in James Merrill's apartment in Stonington, Connecticut, where I served as the Merrill Fellow. You can go and stay there for a certain number of weeks which I did and it blew my mind. Uh, you're surrounded by Merrill's things. Um, time stopped when he died in that apartment. There's even a dry erase a message from him on the dry erase board in the kitchen that's still up. So those are the two things you need to know. Um, I'm gonna jump into the middle of the first section of the book, which sets us in time and place. That fall, he had been invited to live for a time in a famous poet's apartment, among the books and objects that the poet had left behind when he died. The apartment was on the sound, on a little V of land with rocky beaches and foggy moors, high up where the steeples and cupolas were his neighbors. He described the light as it moved from room to room across an eccentric palette of colors from flame to teal, to cherry. Then the darkness took the colors away in the same sequence, flame, teal, cherry, and this happened every day. He could read about these walls, these colors, this light, this dusk in the poet's poems. Or he could put the poems down and look at the walls, or run his hands up and down the walls he'd been reading about all afternoon and ever since he was young, when the poet was alive, standing where now he stood. He wrote, I met him only once when I was in college. He was elfin, skeletal, kind, flirtatious. His mind operated almost apart from his strange body like a drone piloted by a faraway stranger. Now the drone flies through time, not space. Its controller, long dead, still flies it over our heads. A source confirmed, quote, his body was a stick insect, but his smile flashed the news of immortality. It was already November when he wrote again. The first frost ruined all the Nippon daisies and spoiled a single holdout bright pink starlight hydrangea. He had arrived at a trio of symbols, the drone, which he associated with the imagination, the GPS, which connected time and place and suggested those few places in his childhood that remained to this day unchanged and which he visited when he too wished to seem unchanged after so many years. And the buoys, which bobbed independently as aspects or symptoms of the greater force, call it God, call it the ocean, call it chance. The buoys, which drifted this way and that amicably like stars in the night sky. The drone, the GPS, and the buoys, symbols, which he said would tie his book together, ways of understanding himself in the enormity of time, his book only a sliver of the slightly larger sliver his life represented. He had a strange and vivid dream. He was driving in the country on winding roads near his childhood home in Vermont. In the darkness, he struck what he believed was a deer. When he pulled over, he discovered a short bearded man with a pointed hat dead in a ditch by the roadside. He knew instantly that he had killed a troll, the sort of cartoon troll who dwells under bridges in storybooks. He piled the troll's body into the trunk of his car. 
some miles down the road, distressed by the accident, he again struck what he believed to be a deer. When he stopped his car, he discovered dead by the side of the road, the body of the poet Robert Lowell. He loved Lowell's work and had long fantasized about meeting him. He once asked his friend Frank, who had been Lowell's protege, if Lowell would have liked talking to him. Frank seemed to wince, but suggested that yes, perhaps Lowell would have. He put Lowell's large body into the trunk of his car next to the compact body of the troll. Some miles down the road, on an especially dark stretch of highway, he again struck a heavy object or body with his car. He stopped, and there beside the road was the body of a stranger. The stranger was a young man, perhaps 25, though he was badly disfigured by the force of the impact. He put the stranger's body in the trunk of his car on top of Lowell and the troll. With the stranger, Lowell, and the troll in the back of the car, he drove through the night, the horrible weight of his actions settling upon him. In the dream, he was looking for a place to bury or hide the bodies, which when he awoke, he understood to be his dream's own management of time, consciousness, and guilt. When he awoke, there were no bodies to dispose of, but he had a dream he needed to interpret. In the swivel chair where J.M. wrote, he wrote, he wrote, quote, in the swivel chair where J.M. wrote, I read an inscription from our mutual friend, for James, who is a great poet, love Frank. Later that night, he wrote to Frank, quote, I am in Merrill's apartment for a residency and found several books of yours on the shelf, which you'd inscribed for him in the 70s and 80s. Later that night, Frank wrote back, quote, one more world buoyed by talent and money gone. To have what you always effortlessly found to be there, gone. Half in, half out of my dream, deer wander in a bright auditorium. They are serene until they're seen when they bolt and scatter looking for cover. I stand totally still on the half court line. Then I move and the deer go berserk. A doe just split her head open when she rammed a cinder block wall. A fawn pulls all her fur apart and gags on mouthfuls of hide she can't spit. I see the hunger in their stenciled ribs, the furniture inside their skin. And then I'm spared, alone in bed. I'm 46, a trespasser in my dream gym. The deer are children. I'm the maypole they dance around. He wrote, Quote, in my dream, I am in an elementary school. There are deer all around looking for food. They are licking the, 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 they are licking the linoleum floor and biting the wooden risers. I'm standing completely still, terrified of startling them. Before the correspondence slowed that fall, he wrote a series of letters about transformations he had witnessed. For the first time, he told me he had two sons. He told me about changes in their lives as they grew older and changes in his own body as he approached 50. These letters were somber, sometimes hard to follow, as though the pressure of transformation was too much for him to bear. Two times, he lashed out at me for merely listening. In one letter, he claimed to know my real name, which was impossible since I had no real name. I was the channel through which his mind passed. And then I was a gap, an absence, which frightened me. We worried who had imagined whom, which was futile because 
both of us, were fundamentally unreal, like contesting realities in a film. We were held suspended within the larger dream. We alternated coming into and stepping out of the light. The letters would crest with some extraordinary insult against me, which I mirrored back at him. Then he would calm, and the calm became mine, and together we became rather tender and vulnerable, two strangers alone together in a total collaborative non-existence, the happiest and safest place on earth. I received his last letter before Christmas. He was going home to see his mother. His last letter included a poem he'd written about his sons, Euphrasy and Rue, titled after the passage in John Milton's Paradise Lost, which De Quincey had used to describe the feeling of an opium trip. It was never really in his power to hurt me. It was painful to imagine that someone I had imagined had imagined me and could simply stop, leaving me stranded without oxygen, like an astronaut alone in deep space. I knew he felt the same kinds of fear. It was painful to know he'd been hit hard on the face and then again. Though afterwards, he was given tea. It was pleasant to imagine him on a rooftop sunset, reading about a rooftop sunset, writing about a sound sideways peach sunset across buoys and yachts. The day all the water zippered over my head, I knew what being stranded was. My whole life since then, I've been stranded until I dreamed him up. Now since he was gone, I was gone. And since I was gone, he was gone. My imagination is a form of forgery, I wrote, then went to bed. Euphrasy and Rue. Years ago, our sons were born. We named them Iris and Daffodil. They changed, one to Euphrasy and one to Rue. To Euphrasy and Rue, they changed. To Euphrasy, to Euphrasy, to Rue, to Euphrasy and Rue, they changed. Years ago, our sons were born. Our sons were born years ago. On the stereo, we played over and over, over and over, while all the while upstairs, they changed. We played over and over, over and over, while all the while, they changed. One by one, they replaced the days we'd made. One by one, they replaced the days we'd made for them with days they'd made. To Euphrasy and Rue, they changed. They changed to Euphrasy and Rue. They saw the sadness on the other side of the horizon, how flowers blossom and flash and fade, remorse their daily food and cried. Our sons were born, the stereo played over and over, over and over. They changed to Euphrasy and Rue, and now they patrol the skies. <clears throat> That's the last poem in the first section of the long poem. Um, and the second section begins with the following poem. Two, Q and A. Over and over, over and over. By such lures and enchantments is time stopped. What part or season of creation is tusk? It starts time over, new dream, repeat, new dream. As to the creation, where is its refresh button? In a star, in a stock car, on Orion, in the mountains. My heart is anguish. How can I vanish it? Oh, vanish isn't a transitive verb. The song is coming on again. Listen. Silence while the song plays. Silence after the song ends. Silence as the song starts up again.
Who changed change? Die, eight ball, tarot, oracle? Who put the flux in flux? It was my go-to when the slipstream slowed to a trickle, hangover cure, the reason reason gave the river wonder left behind. One day, I'm looking around in my underwear for Paulina Porzkova. Now I'm the leech gatherer. Last week, I'm carded trying to buy copper tone. Now I'm mistaken for my own pallbearer. God made change, Daniel. He made change, change. He made reason, reason. Bother, bother, dust, dust. But why, sister, why did he retire before he made decrease, decrease, limit, limit? Paulina Poroskova and I are having a party. Bill Bixby is dancing with Joanne Worley. We're all very small and very hungry and lonely since all our friends are dead. We're aphids, alone on a dianthus. Renzo was festy, the Armageddon jester in our Catholic monotone Twelfth Night. Years later, he reappeared on Jeopardy, blown like a stray balloon by Hurricane Trebek. Bodhi came home with me my first fall away. I told him we were plutocrats and lived the way a lifeguard lives in the ether, cousins to the horizon. Since it was Friday, it was Pollock. He grew up in a gala orchard near Eureka. Vermont was more upholstered than I'd said. I thought, please God, a shout out from Renzo. When the Pollock appeared, he shoveled it down. He was his Kyoto to my Winooski, hippie angel greaser to my malleable morals, the still point of the changing channels. What happened to Hibbing, Minnesota? They asked Dylan. And Dylan replied, just time. Time is what happened to Hibbing. Imagine outlasting time, appearing on the other side of it, relieved, like, wow, what was that all about? Imagine outlasting time, coming in as from a blizzard, boots off, coat off, mittens frozen into an outstretched hand. They didn't make coats that way back then, said Dylan. There was no crime and no philosophy. People were just too cold back then. Imagine outlasting time to find all of your childhood pets curled up together in a ball. The cat, the fish, the hermit crabs, happy, cozy. A dream, I had the most horrible dream, spake the shepherd fair, to which his last replied, no matter now, we're here now, quiet love. Here I go again into the bone jumpsuit, detail by detail, mortality, cosplay. Reputé, s'il vous plaît, said my memory to me. I did, and still it said, Daniel, reputé. Ring out the dawn. There's a drop of light with my name on it. I'm thirsty for it. Reputé, Daniel. Daniel, reputé. Reputé, s'il vous plaît, Daniel. Daniel, reputé. I'm checking the time. Um, I'm gonna read a few more uh, questions and then Yana and I are gonna chat a little bit and, and, and then as kind of an intermission. And then after that, I'm gonna read the title poem. So just a few more before this, um, before the uh, conversation part of the reading. This is the fourth section of the long poem. It's called Over and Over, For Our Sons. Winter moth, I put your body on and I was happy with the armor. Flight was both possible and necessary since I was light, brittle, and miniature. Flight was both happy and panicky now that I was inside your body. My awareness stretching far beyond my wingspan and erratic decision-making pattern. I was now 
entirely akin to myself. Now I resembled myself both inside and out. Who's the guy with the new temporality of a moth's life, only a day or two in his resplendent powdery body before annihilation minus zero when January in one enormous puff exhaled ice across the landscape. He wrote to me again. He wrote to me again in a dream. A mild winter, a false start for the daffodils and for the fragrant hyacinths whose green was suicidal in the beds and near the hedges and for the snowdrops whose dainty necks bend under the weight of the flower, doomed when they hear their name to misunderstand their natures, bowed, ruined by one frigid day. Why do they talk this way, I asked, I asked him. The flowers, he replied. The poets, I replied. He wrote to me again in a dream. Koyaniskatsi style, all life was time-lapsed into pattern. He emerged from out of the pattern, but was not entirely human. He was more like a string of Christmas lights around a human body. In this form, more pattern than human, he approached me. And then I saw beside him another pattern. He was walking a little dog, a small constellation of lights, tracing the shape of a little low to the ground, comical dog a dachshund or beagle. You could see just from the ways the constellations of their bodies interplayed, they loved each other. The outline of a man and the outline of a dog moving as one being across the field towards me. Why do they talk this way? I asked. The poets, he replied. The flowers, I replied. If the reader will please, sorry, if the reader will now step away from the page, if the reader will now step away from the screen, together we will ponder who imagined whom and downstairs start a new pot of coffee. He wanted to meet me, but our element was time. He approached me where I was standing years later and I approached him where he stood but he was too far in the past. We shared the illusion of approach as on a treadmill. He walked towards me on his treadmill and I walked towards him on mine. Soon we were sprinting towards each other, faster, but no closer, faster, faster, but never closer, trapped in the eternal loop of the machine. His poor dog, his little legs were not meant for such a strain. He was cross with his master. He was exhausted and cross with his master. Coda, Stonington. On the deck upstairs, I read about the deck upstairs. In the daybed, I read about the daybed. In the books I read, I read about the books I read. High up all night, I thought about my sons, how when they wake, I'll be finishing this line, my night, their day, from here on out. Birds, check, first light, sunrise, pole vaulting all night long. My outline splayed on the guest bed where Mary McCarthy stayed. The sponsors, the bats, the bottles, the milk glass tabletop, the china cup, the Santorini guide and smiling lads from 1982. A tin mini license plate read Jim. In a book on one of the shelves, I left a copy of this poem, changed slightly since that night, changed crucially yet slightly since the night I lay on the star deck and made my body an angel in the warm September night above the sound with its bright buoys, the way I did when I was a small child in a snowbank in my zippered snowsuit. You can find this poem inside a book on the shelves in the hidden study. Three to the left of the Santorini guide. Though when you find it, you will see the poem 
changed slightly, crucially, because you know why, because time. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to hear it in your voice, although it's many different voices. Yeah, thanks. All the rhythms really emerge. Oh, good. You read it beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, Yana. Um, yeah. One thing I wonder, this may be more of a specialist question, but when I, what I wonder reading and rereading the book yeah. um, is a structural thing yeah. because there are um, a number of sequences in it. It mm -hmm. seems to be divided into two halves, but the first half is itself divided into poem, four poems and a poem in four phases. Yeah, yeah, right. And each of those poems um, yes. is a sequence of its own, right? Yeah. Which I love, but I wonder, I genuinely wonder how all of that came together, whether you were writing different individual poems um, over time and then found that they fit together or you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, there had to be a principle of break and a principle of continuity. So I have all these internal divisions going, but I also have repeated motifs and elements and so on. So in terms of how it came together, um, you know, I was writing a book of poems uh, in a straightforward way, but I got the idea that I wanted to represent the reader's role in creating meaning and power in a poem. You know, so often I'm a critic, so I'm on the receiving end, getting a book in the mail from a stranger, and it's up to me to make sense of it and build the meanings uh, as best I can, faithfully, but still with a heavy quotient of my own imagination. And then write about the book or teach the book or do all these other things. So I really wanted to show not only the phases that lead into a poem, dreams, daydreams, fragments, drafts, but also what happens once the poem enters the social world. So that's when I came up with this sort of scenario where there's, um, you know, there's a, a narrator who's getting the poems in the mail and describing them and so on. And some of the poems that are set in that section, I wrote, uh, in particular to serve that section. In other words, I wouldn't publish them necessarily as standalone poems. Um, you guys got the one poem, the one called Dream. Uh, none of the poems have titles in the book, but you guys got the one poem we called Dream in the New York Review, which I do stand by. But there are a number of poems that are kind of false starts or things I wouldn't necessarily sign my name to. So, yeah. I would say that. I mean, I, to me, some of the most moving parts of the book are those poems in which these two sort of spectral figures come together. There's that one, I think it's in prose, right? Where the two, and I think you read it tonight, yeah. where they, where was I imagining? Where they run toward each other? Yeah, 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 right, yes, exactly. Yeah, it is in prose. I find that ama amazingly moving. Um, oh, thank you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the other, the other big breakthrough, I'll just make a plug here. Um, I love the film Sans Soleil by Chris Marker, directed by Chris Marker. And I was trying to get a, um, I was trying to hear the woman's voice. Um, and if you know that film, you know exactly why it solved the problem for me. I needed, I, there, it's, a, it's a film where a woman is getting, is narrating letters and diary entries from a, from a person who's traveling and her reading his narration uh, is the voiceover for a series of images. It's just a beautiful film, but yeah. Should we move along to your... Sure, let's do it. So um, I, I'm just going to read one more um, much shorter long poem, the title poem of the book. It's called The Math Campers. Um, it's really a poem about Vermont. Uh, it's a bit of a lullaby to my home state. Um, hi, mom. Um, um, and um, it has almost kind of a YA plot. It's about a group of super smart 15 year old math geniuses who go to a summer camp and because they're having such a good time and falling in love with each other and so on, they figure out a way to hack into time and make the summer endless. And, um, 
anyway, that's what you need to know about it. It's, it takes about seven minutes to read. The math campers, Johnson, Shelburne, Ripton, Vermont, spring 2019. A mayfly born at the break of dawn dies when the sun goes down. A tortoise on an English lawn outlives his master's son's son's son. An ancient shark shakes off another century, eerie and pristine, a fetal dolphin, a steamship, and a sea anemone hang near her, lifeless in the jellied ocean. This shark read over Milton's shoulder. In her extreme old age, she'll stare eye to eye into a skyscraper's foyer at guild amphibious corporate lawyers. The big night stares us down from space. We figured we would have more years. Annihilation in her prom dress greets her platonic date, despair. The black hole poses for her picture wearing a coronet of stars. A glacier, like a mountain only bigger, rides southward on its own shed tears. The deserts, parched for centuries, put on their snorkel gear. Scorpions write their obituaries. A cactus curtsies, then disappears. First in their class, the lichens sprawl like a rash or a blush on the face of a glacial erratic. A thunderclap deafens the marsh. This who's who comes from all over. A thawed field is a gold mine, an uproar over winter berries, chit chat along the power lines. What happens happened later earlier. What happens earlier happened later. Now, frost is a shallow passenger, and biohazards ride the white-tailed deer. A beetle polishes its psychedelic shell. Fireflies splatter paint the night. The keeper's Honda's battery failed, parked near the cemetery gate. The cemetery overlooks the brook that blazed the highway's route. A hurricane washes out the highway. The cemetery seesaws on its bank, then makes a break for the valley. Caskets line up for the slip and slide. A collarbone surfboards down the alley. Through the mudslide, we humans wade. In April, when the animals, in April, when the animals emerge, one by one from their holes, as from an advent calendar, to meet their awaiting identities, the mouse, shimmies into her fur. The patch of blue expects its J. Hello, chipmunk. I am nervousness. In April, when the animals, in April, when the animals emerge as from their office cubicles and the world wakes up enlarged. The spring held all its dividends, then shed them like confetti. Home in Vermont last weekend, I saw biofuel silos in the country, farmers returning to farming, asparagus, ramps, hemp, new ferns along the paths unfurling, and robins waking sleepily. In middle school, if two boys want to kiss or hold hands, they can. Sixth graders learn sea level rise and march with their friends against guns. The hills say there's no single way to be up here this time of spring. Swimmable water in the valley, snow on Mount Mansfield, still falling. In Greensboro, the sobs transformed to Priuses, crustier than the ones in cities, driven by nurses and heiresses. Near Caspian Lake, one day, Chief Justice Rehnquist at his summer house swore Stephen Breyer in, only a part-time village clerk to witness. The circus camp patches its tents, the farm camp rouses on the hill, a goat behind a wire fence prepares to be clumsily milked, 
hard problems at the math camp wait all winter for solutions. Engorged sums hibernate and dream of consolation. A raft dry docked through winter gets its feet wet and waits for July when the math campers arrive to stare at the stars and calculate the absolute value of 15 or how the summer might expand and prove eternal by division of hours or days into hours, minutes, seconds. They're factoring love in suddenly and measuring how the stars in pairs create the sky's geometry and measuring their heart's spheres, skew lines of who they are and were. They know year over year you grow by comparing consecutive summers and expressing them in a ratio. Now in the interval between dodgeball and snack, the math campers back of the envelope equations they must solve to make the summer longer. They've meted out the summer with the math they've done so far. If they want a longer summer, oh, they'll have to practice harder. For every correct answer, one more hour, a furlough from the changing leaves. The daisies cheer from the bleachers and bumblebees gossip about love. Rationalists will say they failed. Fall came and bulldozed the bees. The daisies saw their heads explode and parents returned in their SUVs. The raft was dragged to a frozen lawn. The October stars withdrew into relations of their own. Ice strangled the bright yarrow. Black adder has a restraining order against hyssop. Fucking psycho arrived in a three-wheeler and did donuts in the meadow. An astronaut unzips his suit and masturbates to the turning earth while distant galaxies ejaculate in acid trips of death and birth. First in his class, he spends the day on beating off and solo chess and writing in his diary, I gave up earth for fucking this. An organ on the TV mass plays all day for company. The wonders of the universe turn into drudgery. The universe, first in its class, elaborates its origin in the enormity of space. Light finds its lost horizon, then vanishes in ecstasy. A dust cyclone undoes the sun and kills our opportunity. The little rover lost its friends. First in his class, he toiled hard on valedictory remarks for his own graduation. Quote, my battery is low, it's getting dark. That was wonderful, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I feel, like, I feel like listeners here who haven't read the whole book don't quite hear the full dimensions behind it because it follows an earlier section that's also devoted to the math campers. That's right, wow. it's a play and there's no way to read it aloud. Um, I could, you know, I, uh, there's an audio book actually that they did, which is quite, quite lovely and, it, and they cast all of the ro roles in that play. So that's the way to do it. But I don't have, I don't have a cast available. I'm sure you could do it, but that does sound worth hearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you. Does anyone have questions they want to ask Dan? There is a chat box at the bottom, I think, where you can write your questions. Um, you can enter questions right here. Here we go. Even something that's more of a comment. <laughs> we can turn into a question. <laughs> I was going to say, I, you know, you were describing the, um, the the more fragmentary parts of the book as things that you wouldn't necessarily yeah. publish on their own. But I think that, at least in the context of the whole thing, they are some of the most intense parts. Like there are pages where there's just one or a couple of lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And they yeah. really distill things. 
yeah. in a beautiful way. Thank you. Do we have questions? Um, yeah, there's some questions. A question about the cover? Yeah, I'll answer that one. That's Corey, my friend. Um, yeah, here's the book. And um, the cover is an illustration from a homemade magazine that I bought um, at a book fair. It was a magazine that was put together by a bunch of teenage friends in the 1880s. And it's full of illustrations and riddles and acrostics and short stories and poems. And this very mysterious image just spoke to me. And I thought, well, these teenagers who put this little thing together to amuse themselves and to shape time in some way were sort of like the proto math campers. So that's right. I, and then um, Kelly Blair at Knopf, who's a, a fantastic designer, you know, used the image and transformed it. So yeah, shout out to her. It's beautiful. Um, someone is asking, what did you read when you were 15? That's Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Um, <laughs> Uh, when I was 15, I think I read a separate piece. <laughs> 15 is a little young. I was, I wasn't yet, uh, I hadn't really become literary. I was more about basketball and tennis. Um, the first poets that really spoke to me, um, were, you know, Eliot and Stevens and the whole modernist generation, Marion Moore in particular. Um, I just had a great high school teacher who introduced us to really difficult poetry. And um, that was it. That's all it took. Elliot is not easy in high school. <laughs> no, but, you know, Prufrock is such an adolescent, you know, his self-dramatizing nature, I thought was, yeah. I read some of your own comedy back to that as well, I think. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. In the best way, I mean. I no, know. no, I agree. No, it's, it, yeah, it's a poem about mortification, I think. And mm -hmm. I, I, I've felt plenty of that in my life, so, yeah. And the constant sort of deflating of the self. I think that's something that you do wonderfully. Oh yeah, that's for, true. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you want to take one more? Or? Sure, why don't, do you want to pick it since you're seeing them too? I, I feel like you should. Um, I'm reading a, a, a question from Chris Spade, who is a great uh, critic and poet. Uh, so hi, Chris. Um, and do I find something filmic in the manner of the book generally? Yeah, uh, a film, a, a, the, the essay film, I think, is, is, is the genre that most it inspired it. And you know, Chris Marker is one of the great practitioners. So not only sans soleil, but some of the time travel stuff goes back to the film La Jete. Um, you know, I'm not extraordinarily, extraordinarily literate in movies, but, I, but as with music, I just watch the same ones over and over and over again. So the ones I know, I know very well. Maybe we should call it a night. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thanks, thank everybody. You, for Jackson. Thank, thank, you, Mara. Mara. thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, Maris. Bye. Bye. Bye, Yana's book. Bye, Dan's books. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>